You guys stand with me this morning. All right, let's pray before we worship. Lord, we just come to sit at your feet, Lord. Lord, that the attitude of our hearts would just be bowed down before you. Um, Lord, that we would just humble ourselves in your presence, Lord, knowing that there is nothing that we have to offer, Lord, that your ways are higher than our ways, so we can just set all of our plans, all of our ideas, Lord, even all of our fears and doubts and failures, we can set all those things aside, Lord. Lord, we just invite you here to meet with us today, Lord. In your name, amen. Stay standing for, for all the songs. There's only two more. <laughs>
don't worry, don't be afraid. For the Lord our God is with us, his promise remains. Jesus said there will be tribulation, but then he said, take heart for I have overcome. Jesus said, there will be tribulation, but then he said, take heart for I have overcome. Oh, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. Oh, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. Oh, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. Oh, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. No, I won't lose heart because I believe that I will see the goodness of the Because I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord. No, I won't lose heart. Because I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord. No, I won't lose heart. Because I Jesus said there will be tribulation but then he said take heart for I have overcome Lord God I pray that our eyes would not be on the storm that our eyes would not be on the flames Lord but that they would be stayed and fixed on you Lord, I just pray that you would come and fill this place with your spirit, Lord. Lord, that you would renew each one of us as we are washed in the water of your word, Lord. Lord, that we would be steadfast, that we would be ready to do your will, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would just bless this morning and our time of fellowship, Lord, that you would knit us together and grow us together as your church, Lord. In your name, amen. You guys can take a moment to greet one another.
All right, we'll get started here. Uh, if you guys will open your Bibles, we are in 1 Peter chapter 3. We'll be starting in uh, verse 18 officially um, as we get started. I'm going to pray and then we'll get into the word today. So Lord, we thank you so much for this time we can gather here in your presence in this place. We are so grateful for your word and uh, the way that you've preserved it for us in a way that we can easily understand in our own language, Lord. And um, I just pray that you would use this opportunity to come together, to discuss, to, to learn, to grow. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Guide us through these things, Lord, and give us wisdom that you would want us to have for each one of us, as then that goes and edifies the church. So we just pray, Lord, for that um, opportunity for discipleship, for growth, for learning, um, and even for you know, confession and, and uh, you know, restoration, things that happen that we need to change in our lives, Lord. We'll be discussing those things today. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity as your word presents it in order and decently. We can go through it and we can be those who, uh, who apply things to our lives, Lord. So we praise you now for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So because we're having our food right after, we are going to go long. Um, just so you know, <laughs> I mean, it just goes without saying, right? So, um, so buckle up. No, it's, uh, we're going to actually, we're going to be going from verse 18 of chapter 3 to the end of that, and then the first six verses of chapter 4. Um, but I do have extensive notes because there's going to be a lot of, um, I'm going to call it congruency maybe, or there's, there's going to be concurrence between what Peter is saying and a lot of what Paul is saying, and what Jesus says in the gospel. So because of that, we're going to need to do some time traveling through the, the pages. And that's why I brought my, we're joking about this, but I brought my, um, my clicker for the training so that every time you hear the click, we're going to turn the pages and keep, no, no I'm, I'm really good, I'm joking. Um, I just forgot I had that in my pocket. Um, but we were joking about that before, that by the end of this, you'll just be here, click and just turn pages all of a sudden. Joking. Works on my dog, though. She's, a, she's doing great. Okay, so we're going to we'll read through the text. We'll read through the whole text, and then we'll go back and, um, as I say, unpack what uh, Peter is uh, saying for us here in this section. So, starting in verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring to us, or bring us, rather, to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers, having been made subject to him. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Now, it's, we go through this, and this is obviously coming off of what Peter was saying before, he talked about suffering for doing good. He talked about suffering, and you know, we, we all talked about all the, the suffering that happens, and, you know, and even in marriage, you got the engagement ring, the wedding ring, and the suffering. You know, the, we all know what suffering is, and we just need to understand that it's part of life. And on a seriousness, when you do suffer, especially for the sake of Christ, it can be worn as a, a badge of honor. It can, uh, it can be a good indicator that you're doing the right thing, because if you're going in the right direction, the enemy is going to come against you. I mean, think about any sport you play. If you're doing a good job and doing the right thing and heading towards the goal, the enemy or the op opposing team is going to stop you. They're going to be more active and more intense in their ability to try to intercept you before you get to your goal. So it just makes perfect sense that if we are following the Lord and getting closer to Him and growing in Him and, and seeking His will, 
that the enemy is going to then oppose us defensively and try to stop us from what we're trying to do. And those things don't feel very good. And feelings do have a lot to do with our lives. Like, we have feelings for a reason. They weren't invented just arbitrarily by the Lord. They, we have feelings, we have all kinds of things, but it's all within balance. If we trust in our feelings, then we're going to be led astray. If we use those things to, as a guide to direct us in making better decisions and pray through those things, then we have something to go on there. So just to consider it, suffering itself feels like a bad thing, but it's actually a part of life and an indicator. We're not guaranteed an easy ride. We're not guaranteed an easy walk through this life. We're actually guaranteed a difficult one as we follow the Lord. So in that context, Peter is not harping on this, but he's reiterating the fact that suffering is a clear part of life, and it's going to happen. And even looking at the example of Jesus Christ, that he suffered, and he says that in verse 18, Christ suffered once for sins. This is a suffering that is beyond anything that we can possibly even understand. Anything that ever happens to us is just a drop in the bucket considering what Christ went through for us and for the entire world. So for us to ever complain, like, man, this suffering is unbearable. Well, I mean, we are weak in the flesh, and so it's probably right, but it's not even close to what he did for our salvation, which we know is far more eternally valuable than anything, you know, anything we might lose here, you know, heartache or uh, I mean, these things are all real, but just anything that we could possibly lose in this life is not even close to even mattering compared to what Christ did for us. And if you put it in that context, it makes you feel a little different about what's going on. Like, you know, sometimes you can be like, you know, this suffering and going through for the sake of Christ, for doing good, I can, I can actually feel good about that. I can, I can withstand, I can know that the Lord is with me to help me through these things. So we see in verse 18, Christ suffered once for sins. He died for the sake of saving us from our sins. The just, or justified, for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. I mean, there is, we have a separation. We're going to talk about that later. The, the story will come up of um, the rich man and Lazarus. But down in the underworld, while Christ was alive, he told a story about this gulf. There's, there's a separation. We have a separation between us. There's a gulf between us and unsaved and a holy God. We cannot reconcile that ourselves. We need a way to bridge that gap, essentially, and the one who provided that one way is Jesus Christ. He brought us to God, and he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. He was, and, and this is essentially what Easter is all about, right? We're, we're just, it's a resurrection Sunday. We're talking about the fact that, yes, he died for our sins. He was the, what they would call the atoning sacrifice in the Old Testament. That would be when the lamb was slain, the blood was spilled, and, and that sacrifice was made to atone for our sin, to make it right, but it was temporary. That blood sacrifice covered it for that year, but it wasn't enough for once and for all. But Jesus paid one price once and for all, for all who will accept it. That is a fact. That's what we have our hope in. And the fact that he rose from the dead, the fact that he was made alive, after being dead. He physically died. And one of the things some of the commentators brought up, just as a, not a side note, but just something to consider, is that Jesus came as a man. He didn't came to possess a man. He was a man. He was 100% man and 100% God. He came and lived in a full and complete life, up to age 33, and he took our sin upon him as the just sacrifice in order to do that. His obedience to that, even though he didn't deserve it, he took on something he did not deserve in order to save us, to bring us to God. And then he was made alive. So that confirmed what was done. That brought him back to life, and it brings us with him. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, and So it talks about that, and I'm going to read a few passages just to kind of um, to tie that in. One thing about being just is something that we, we read back in uh, Matthew 19, uh, starting in verse 16. This is just a, a concept verse. It says this, Now behold, one came to him and said, Good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So he said to them, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. So the point that he's, he's making there just to, is that you're calling me good, but the only one that's good is God, so you're calling me God. And that is true, right? So he's, he's like setting the stage like, yeah, so you're getting the concept, but you're going to have to piece these things together understand that 
as God in the flesh, I am the one that's going to make that work. I am the one that's going to make that atonement. I am the one that's going to be your hope. Um, so we have this understanding that the just, there's only one just man that was able to do it, and he did it. So again, he didn't just die for us. That's, that's one step of it. The fact that we celebrate the resurrection is because that is the, that is the proof that what he did was more than sufficient, that he provided for, there's, there's no limitation. I wouldn't believe in a limited atonement only for those who will. It's for anyone who will, all who will. So he made atonement for all sinners for all time who will accept him and, and those who don't. It's still there. Anyone is available to receive. And so that's why it's not limited. Now, the other thing that happens, we see this being made alive by the Spirit. We need to understand how that all ties together. And so we'll do that by referencing a few different verses here, one in the Gospel of John and a few other in Paul's books of Ephesians and 2 Corinthians. So I want to just read these so we can kind of come along with this. I mean, we're, we're going to stick in, in verse 18 here for just a couple more minutes. So he rose again to prove, again, that he paid that price, and it was, it was sufficient. It was more than enough. And then it says he returns to the Father to sit at his right hand. He goes with him. So in John 14, 15, and 18, this is what happens after that. He says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. So there we see the, the concept of the Holy Spirit that appeared in the Old Testament, but now it's going to be made available through what Jesus did now that that's been confirmed. He's going to leave, and, and then the, the Father will send the Holy Spirit, another helper, the comforter, the one that's close beside you. Um, it, it literally means uh, from close beside making a call. So it's the one who's going to help you make judgment calls. It's the one that's going to help you through your life. This is the Holy Spirit will be with you and in you, right? So he's, he's on our team. We're constantly able to be with him all the time. He's like a, an advocate. He, he helps you make the good decisions. He's close to the situation to, to help you through the things you need, like trials, tribulations, those types of things. And he's this... Um, we're going to see here in Ephesians chapter 1, he's called the, the guarantee. Um, this, this is like the down payment, if you will. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14 says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of the glory. It's purchased by the blood of Christ. The guarantee is the down payment, the earnest money that says that, yes, you know, this, he, the Holy Spirit is here, and someday Jesus is going to come back and claim what he bought. And that'll be when we are taken up with him. That's what we believe based on the Scripture, the full context of the Scripture. Then we have in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, it says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. 2 Corinthians 5, 1-8, For we know that our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed. If, if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared, prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. He's going to bring us to God, alive by the Spirit. Like you see the correlation there. These are the same types of concepts. Paul and, and Jesus himself, when he was in, in, on the earth before his, his uh, crucifixion and resurrection, and Peter here, they're all agreeing. They're all saying the same things. They're, they're reiterating these truths that we have the Holy Spirit, that Christ died for our sins, that he rose again to like, confirm that is true, 
And because of that, we are now being brought to God. And that's something that we, nobody could do. Nobody could do that. Only one. And made alive by the Spirit. We are only alive spiritually because of the Holy Spirit, because of what He's left us with, to, the, the Holy Spirit to guide us through, to do these things that we do. We, we walk by faith, not by sight. That's an important concept. And as we, he continues in, as we read earlier, he's going to say how to live out things, how to change your perspective, how to modify your behavior, th- like that these are necessary. It's almost like we're going to have to see that even though we have this truth and even though we can choose to kind of stay there and not move forward, it, you, you have to. You're compelled to. And as Paul says, it's our reasonable service to give ourselves to the Lord, to allow Him to work through us. That's what just comes naturally, based on what price has been paid, that we are bought with a price, with the blood of Christ. So these are the concepts that he's he's bringing up here as we see that you're going to have to balance that spiritual truth with the fleshly reality that we live in. We're going to be burdened physically. That's going to draw on our feelings, emotion, our physical um, state here and how we feel, but then we have to just remember the truth that's not about feelings, it's about actual hope, like foundational things that we know for a fact we're we're locked in. The Holy Spirit of truth is helping us, so that's where we have to find that balance, and an imbalance can bring poor decisions, and can bring, you know, the depression, and can bring, uh, like, just all kinds of terrible things, and so he's reminding us of these as we go through this, this section of scripture. Then we get to another, these next couple verses, and these get a little um, debatable. Um, and so I'm going to present a couple different concepts, ideas that you know have been out there. Um, the good thing about these is that wherever you want to land, it's not actually dogmatically necessary to land anywhere for your salvation. This is like, if you can understand it or if you think you do, that's great. But it's when you make this something like, I have to believe the way I do, and if you don't, then I can't be on the same page as you at all. That becomes a problem. So, so what he's going to say here is a little, it's not off, it's just that I don't have a full understanding of it. We can try to guess based on other scripture references, which we're going to try to do. And then in the end, I believe this is another one of those things that I put on my checklist, because I like checklists, of what I'm going to ask when I get to heaven. I need to know, Peter, what were you saying here? Because I could never quite understand or come to a logical 100% conclusion I speculated, I used conjecture in my, the brain that God gave me, but I just can't quite land on something because it isn't a necessary salvation issue. We don't have to get all crazy about it. I don't know, just lack of a better term. So just keep that in mind as we go through. I'm just going to read this again. So, made alive by the Spirit, 19, by whom he, capital H, went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. So, what, what is this? He went and preached to the spirits in prison. So, he being Jesus, because we, we know that we're just talking about Jesus. Um, or, yeah, by, by whom, first of all, so by whom, which is by the Spirit, we just said in verse 18, he went, so Jesus went and preached. The word for preached is caruso, which is to herald or proclaim something, some authoritative word of God. It could be the gospel message. It could be anything. It's to, just to herald or proclaim something. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Um, and, and the prison is just a, a word for some, something under guard or under watch, something that's, you know, just like a prisoner. You're, just, you're not able to leave. So, again, what, what does that mean? Um, and then also, the spirits, the word is, in my Bible, it's, it's a lowercase s. It's the word pneuma, which could mean wind, breath, or spirit. It's most commonly translated as the word spirit. And then when they add the word holy to it, it this defines what spirit is. If it's the Holy Spirit, then they add that. If it's not, then it's something else. So the spirit's in prison. And then just to kind of put it in more context, we've seen the next verse that there's a differentiation between spirits in prison and then the eight souls saved through water. So then it's like, are we, what are we talking about? What's, what uh, spirits are we talking about? Like the spirit of man? Are we talking about angels? Are we like, what are we talking about? We don't, 
We're talking about those who were disobedient in the days of Noah. Like those are like human, there's a few different things. So again, we're, we're getting hints, but we're not quite getting a direct statement. It's it's kind of like you need the context, and sometimes these contexts are um, delivered through traditional writings of the Jews and things like you can get more con- like Peter would have had a little more context because he has those extra biblical rabbinical writings and traditions handed down and we don't have all of those things so there's some things that they just know that we don't and that's that's totally okay because we have to believe that God gave us what we needed so if we don't have everything we need to have a full understanding then we can understand that maybe that's okay we're fine we can, we can still move on from there, right? But let's just try to figure this out for a second. Let's just throw some things out there. So this could be a clue about the, the spirits, the souls, like the different, and, and the, the situation here, and who was disobedient. Um, so let's, let's read a couple things just to kind of level set. So there's a reference in Jude. Jude has one chapter, verses 5 and 7. It says this, but I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who do not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So that seems to be referring to, because then it also goes as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these have given themselves to sexual immorality, gone after strange flesh, set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So there's, there's judgment for both fallen angels and for humans. There is judgment for both, right? We're told that. So we do know that they're all judged one way or the other. They're just in a slightly different way. So it's hard to tell who is being preached to and what's being preached and, and, and what the, who the audience is. Um, it seems like Jude is talking about the great white throne judgment that we refer to in Revelation 20. Like, the great judgment, the great day, right? That, that makes sense. Um, and just to remind you, we, uh, we see in Revelation 20, verse 11, um, John writes, Then I, uh, through the Spirit, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, uh, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So we have this reference to the lake of fire. We were also referenced to that same lake of fire, the chapter before in Revelation, in, verse, uh, in chapter 19, verse 19 and 20, it says, I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army, Jesus' army. Then the beast was captured and within the false prophet who worked signs in the presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. So we see the judgment happening for um, humans. Those, those two are human possessed by demons is what we're, we uh, see. And then we also see that everyone who doesn't have Jesus Christ, everyone who does not have salvation, say, you know, being saved, is then judged according to their works, which their works cannot add up to a salvation, and they're judged for that. So we see this judgment happening, and it, it's kind of like we're talking about, he preached to the souls in prison. There's a judgment going on. We see something about this uh, disobedience with Noah and the ark, and so we're trying to, kind of put these things together. So it, it could be angelic. It, we, uh, we, we know that demons know that they're going down hard, right? Um, he actually, we have a, re- a recording, not recording, but it's recorded in Matthew chapter 8, verse uh, 29, Jesus is having conversation with two demon-possessed men, and the demons speak, and they say, have you come here to torment us before the time? So Jesus is being addressed by the demons and saying they, they know there's going to be a torment and they know there's going to be a time. It's not like they're, they're tricked by this. There's also a reference to 2 Peter. He says later in his second epistle, um, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, he says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher, of righteousness bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. You could say that um, 
that maybe Noah is, was the preacher and that he preached the gospel. He told them salvation. No one, no one received it. There wasn't one righteous person outside of Noah. So every single person on the earth besides Noah and his family, the eight people, eight souls, were judged at that time. And they were judged through water. Uh, so that's, that's, that's one aspect of it. Um, now, if we go back to the, and this is where things get a little muddy too, if you go back to Genesis and look at that passage and, and read everything about it, you kind of see a few different things going on. There's some mixing and matching going on. And so we have to unpack that. So Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 through 8 says this, It came to pass when men be, began to multiply on the face of the earth, this is very early, um, daughters uh, were born to them, and the sons of God saw the daughters of men. That they were beautiful. They took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not thrive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of um, the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Not that he was individually uh, righteous, but that he, was, he, had, he received grace. So we have this example all the way back in Genesis of grace, but we also have this, this passage that talks about all kinds of different things. Like, is it angels mingling with humans trying to, like, taint the bloodline? Is it just renowned mighty men? I mean, there's a lot of different things. Um, theories that people have, conspiracy theories, if you want. It's like all these things that they consider when they read something like this, mix it with what Peter's saying, and then just kind of tie it all together again. W what whatever it ends up to be does not take away from the fact that Jesus died for our sins. You know, like that's where people can't really get over some things. They have one issue that's like gray in the Bible, and they're like, well, I throw the whole thing out. I'm like, it doesn't really make any sense. Um, not to wear my heart on my sleeve or anything, but like, come on, you can't, you can't just do that. Like, there's nothing that's completely, like, totally defined all the time. You can't just always bank on having a complete understanding never getting it wrong, you know, nothing, you know, like, I, my understanding has to be 100% or else I can't believe anything. Like, can't do that. You can't say, like, if I don't understand it now, it's not real. Like, that doesn't make sense. We can't say that we're that perfect, that if we don't have an understanding, that it can't be true. We just need to understand that we don't understand God, and that's the way it should be. We should seek to understand God, seek the Holy Spirit to teach us the things we need to know, and it, maybe we don't need to know these things. But it's in the Bible, so we're going to read it anyway. And we're just going to you know, kind of be awestruck by the fact that we have all this information at our fingertips and that God has a plan through the entire ages. He had grace built in all the way back in the first time he judged the entire earth. Like That was a concept. And it carried all the way through, all the way to Jesus. It was like he planned it from the beginning or something. It's pretty cool. So again, piecing this together, we're only in the second and third verse that we were starting in today. Um, so then, on the other hand, it could, I mean, it could be angels, fallen angels, that they were, like, bound under darkness, and, and you know, they're, they're being preached to, and, and not necessarily, like, given the gospel, of course, they can't be saved, but they were at least heralded to the fact that whatever they tried to do didn't work. That could be it. Don't know. Could be um, that it is humans, and proclaiming the victory is kind of like, if, if Christ did proclaim this, like physically, if he went into the underworld, as he explained in Luke 16, that he would be able to speak. Because we, if we read it, we might be able to put our mind around that concept that this could be true. Again, just this is an idea. Jesus said these words in, in Luke chapter 16, verse 22 through 31. He said, so I'm, I skipped the first part of the, the, the story, but we had the rich man and Lazarus. They both died. There we go. And that's basically the gist of the story. So it was the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and being in torments in Hades, this is the, the rich man, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, 
son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you should send into my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them that they also come to this place of torment, or they, um, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Now something just to witness here is we see this before Jesus' resurrection, He's telling us before he's even crucified that there's this holding tank in the underworld. There's the Abraham's bosom and then there's the torment. So, but there's communication. There's a way to, to speak back and forth. So if Jesus were to die as, as a man, which he did, and he goes to the place where all dead men go before he was resurrected, then it's possible that he was physically there and he proclaimed victory in the fact that he was going to be resurrected. And it could have been, too, um, these who were formerly disobedient back in Noah's day, because none of them were saved. They were all evil continually, as we read in, in Genesis chapter 6. So it, it could have been that he's like, you should have listened to Noah. He was right. The boat was for reals. You know, that's kind of that thing. And, and the fact is, is that just, he's going to kind of tie that together, but I have died for the sins of all. So he's like maybe proclaiming the gospel, not for them to be saved, but for them to know. Like, and not even in a way like we would, like in your face, but like it's, it's just stating the fact. Like Jesus is there, he lived, he died, and then he was risen from the dead. So he was there and then he left. So that's another in, interpretation. It's, and it makes sense in the context of what Jesus spoke of of this story. And so we could maybe believe that he gave us that story just to have that understanding. Whether that is 100% accurate or not, Again, I'm not going to land dogmatically on one or the other because I don't really know. And I'm comfortable saying that. It's like, okay, th this is interesting, and these are some possibilities, and there's a lot of commentaries that go back and forth and have their reasons, and I think they have to land on something to put into print, but in the end, it, either way, we're still good in Christ, so I'm, I'm okay with that. But it does say that they were disobedient when the divine law and suffering weighed in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few that saved souls. So it, it seems like maybe it was those souls, those people, those spirits. You know, it could be a mix of both. I mean, there were fallen angels dealing with men at that time, so it could be any of those things or a combination of the two. Um, but either way, the important thing is that the ark was prepared and that eight souls were saved. That's the important part of the story. Not necessarily who got preached to in the underworld. It's, it's, it's that the fact is that there was this what he's going to call in verse 21 an, an anti-type. They were saved through water. So we're going to see that there's this judgment and that God held off judgment until the preparation was made. Once the preparation was made, then the judgment came and those eight souls that were righteous were saved through the fact that the water wiped out everything. And so then he's going to tie that in in verse 21, the fact that that ark saved them, right? It... it uh, protected them from the water that was judging, and they were able to um, be saved. And then we have this thing called baptism, which is why we believe in the immersion baptism, because the boat was, was in the water. It wasn't, didn't get sprinkled. It was like in the water, right? Un, un, in the water. It probably went pretty low in the water, too. So if you see verses 21 and 22 to end the chapter, he goes on from the Noah story and the picture of the ark to say, there is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you take the parentheses out for a second, there's an antitype which now saves us, baptism, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's like you can kind of see that the baptism is a direct representation. And the word antitype, what it means, is something that is represented by a symbol. Baptism is symbolic of the, res the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we do it. That's why it's commanded. And it, it's commanded because we should relate to it. It should be the realest thing that we know. And, and being baptized and making that public proclamation of what's 
happened inside of you is, is an important part of your walk. Now, side note, we do know that it doesn't say that you need to receive Jesus Christ's free gift and be baptized to be saved. It says you're saved through Jesus Christ and then you be baptized. It's like something you just do afterward because it's important to, to, to make that statement for both yourself and for those around you. But we, you know, the example we use is the thief on the cross, clearly not saved, clearly dying, stuck on the cross. Jesus told him he was saved because he believed. Didn't get baptized. So we can be rest assured that if you've never been baptized, I encourage you to, but not necessary for salvation but some would argue, why not? I leave that up to you. That would be the Holy Spirit. Your helper, your, your helper is helping you work, work, wade, wade through that one, we'll say. Um, but again, we, we don't want to, and he doesn't want to put baptism up on a pedestal. He doesn't want to make it that the baptism saves you. He doesn't want to, you know, a lot of people maybe have a history in certain churches, they get baptized as children, they feel like they're now locked in, that they've done their, their time, they've paid their respects to God and, and gone through the rituals, and that's what's important. But it's actually, that's an after effect of the real thing, which is the, the grace that has saved us, the grace of Jesus Christ. So we have to get that straight. So he does emphasize in the parentheses, not the removal of the filth of the flesh. It wasn't like the, the ark got a, you know, got washed, like it wasn't like a power washing on the outside by God. It was literally that the, the earth was judged and wiped away. The, the sins were wiped away through the water. And that's what happens when we're baptized. We, we die with Christ and we go, and we're going to read some of these references here in just a second. But it's the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection. The key is the resurrection, and the baptism is the, the representation of that. It reminds us, just like a communion reminds us of, of Christ and what he did. It's, it's a reminder. It's a symbol. Baptism is a symbol of what Jesus did through, this, um, through his death, burial, and resurrection. So to get a little bit more context in that, a little bit more definition outside of this, Peter obviously agreeing with the rest of the, the, you know, the gospel accounts and the other epistles, they're all working together harmoniously through the Spirit. So we can go to Romans chapter 6 and read this and understand that this is exactly the same thing. Paul says this in chapter 6, verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many as of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ who was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul said it in 11 verses. Peter said it in like one. But, I mean, you can see the, clearly the, the harmony in what's being said here. That this, this whole concept of being death and being buried in the waters of baptism, to, to wash away the old man, the sin, like the flood, washed away the sin of the world. The sinful man was washed away. We then emerge, we're submerged, and we emerge from the water clean, a new creation, a new man. And we have to now live that way. So it's, it's symbolic of a change in our lives. It's a, sim, it's a symbol showing that it's no longer the old way. And that's what's going to be said later on in, in chapter 4. That's why they're tied together. And, and in my Bible, they put those little headers in there to help you kind of follow along. They're tied right together because this next six verses go right along with what we just read. Because you can't, 
you can't receive Jesus Christ, receive forgiveness of sins, and be related to him through baptism, you can just, you, we understand that, and then come up and then have nothing change. You can't do that. It doesn't work that way. There's no, there's no possibility of that happening. There's no way that it could act, if you're, if you're really saved and you really identify with Christ through baptism, then you are a different person. You're a completely different person. And this is what we celebrate again on, on Easter Sunday, on the Resurrection Sunday. This year it's April 9th. It's coming right up. This, the resurrection is the key. And that's why he says that, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then he points out that he's gone to, in, in verse 22, who, Jesus, has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So we have positionally, now he's in authority over us. Not only have we been saved by him and, and brought to God through him and that he's done this on our behalf, and then we, we go into the waters of baptism to, to kind of put ourselves in that position physically to relate to that, then we see that our new, you know, our Lord is rightfully at the right hand of God. Like, th- we're not answering to like a manager. This is like, can I just talk to your manager? Like, this is like the manager. This is like the creator. That's who we answer to. That's who has saved us. And so that takes a, a level of reverence that we, we definitely need to pay attention to. It's not something we can be flippant about. And that's why he's going to talk about even considering the old ways is, is out. Can't do it. Got to move on. Those things, when you have those memories and you know, the old times, the old ways, when you start going down old, old uh, paths again, you stop you get stopped quickly. Your conscience will stop you quickly. That's why, that's what it's talking about. You're, they're changed. You can't walk down those roads anymore comfortably. You can't just approach or, or dip your toe in the pool of the old man and be like, it's not a comfortable temperature. It's nothing that you want to do anymore. It's ice cold. It's not good. You know, it's like repelling. It's not, not okay. I don't like a cold shower. I don't like a cold pool. I don't like going in the ocean in the, in the, and at all. I actually don't like going in the ocean, period, in the summer. It's too cold. You know, I like a nice, warm, comfortable thing. So I cannot be comfortable going into that old way. It has got to be completely off limits. And it's nothing you do in the, in the flesh. It's something that you have this good conscience. You have a change in your heart that says, no, this is not you. You're a new creation. You're a new person. You came out of that water and your sin was gone. We don't give in to those things anymore. We don't indulge in those things anymore. Now, again, falling and stumbling and getting back up and moving on, that's part of life. But we don't say, well, we're just going to keep going. Like, I fell into it and I'm just going to just head down that way now. You can't do that. You, 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 get, you get stopped because you have that helper. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the understanding. You're, you've been turned away from those things. It's, you, you've died to that. It's no longer possible. Uh, Spurgeon said this. He said, Noah was not saved by the world's being gradually reformed and restored to its primitive innocence. I thought that was funny. Um, but a sentence of condemnation was pronounced, and death, burial, and resurrection ensued. Noah must go into the ark and become dead to the world. The floods must descend from heaven and rise upward from their secret fountains beneath the earth. The ark must be submerged with many waters. Here was burial, and then after a time, Noah and his family must come out to a totally new world of resurrection life. Same idea. same idea. That's why he's putting these things together. It, it is an antitype. It is what makes sense. Like you, I love that, becoming dead to the world. When I was a kid, being dead to the world meant something different. Like, like Earth to Travis. Hello, Travis. Hey, yeah, you're dead to the world here. Yeah, no, you become dead to the world system and what the world stands for. You no longer represent those things. You no longer relate to those things. You're completely foreign to those things. And he's going to go into those things momentarily. But we see positionally at the very end of this uh, verse here um, that he's gone to heaven at the right hand. We see that in other places. We see that right in Mark chapter 16, verse 19. It says, So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, the disciples, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Direct, direct quote right there. Luke 24, verses 15 51. And he led them out as far as Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Positionally, he's in heaven. He told them he was going to go to heaven. He's going to send another helper. That was 
There was a little bit of a pause in between, but it happened. All right? And then we, um, Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, he gives us a really good concept and understanding of this as well. He says in verse uh, 15 of Ephesians chapter 1, he says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in also that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I think that encapsulates it quite nicely. Same concept, very much in agreement, Peter and Paul. It all works together here. So then we move into chapter 4. So he says, therefore, so again, it just rolls right into it. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. This is a, an invitation. He's, and this is, this is something to pr- be prepared for, to prepare yourself. He says, arm yourselves. And, and the word, it's the only time this particular word is used in the New Testament in the Greek, um, hoplizo, it just means to make ready or to arm yourself or equip yourself. To, you know, you might even, I mean, we could, we could kind of talk about like having your, your firearm ready or even the, when you think about the, um, the, the armor of God, like you're preparing yourself, you're, you're getting prepared with the things you need. You, you arm yourself with this. Arm yourself with the same mind. We want to be like-minded, think the same things as Christ. We want to understand where his suffering, where that led him, why that led him there, and what that means for us. And that should have a meaning that is deeper than just knowledge. That is like a deep understanding and, and essentially a feeling. You can feel grateful for what Christ has done for you and what he's done for the whole world. You can feel that and that, that's okay. But you want to arm yourself with the same mind, not the same feelings. You want the same mind. We want to actually be on purpose doing these things because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Suffered is, the word is, is pasho, which means to feel heavy emotion, especially suffering. Um, so the fact is that it's, it's a heavy emotional thing. Um, Christ suffered for us in the flesh. He, had the, he did have a heavy emotion. And in the flesh, we can understand he who has suffered in the flesh, suffered in the flesh, meaning like denying the things of the flesh, obeying God despite the temptation, taking God's way out. Those are the things that he's talking about. So we're going to follow Christ and that he never sinned. Our goal and objective is to avoid and not sin, right? It's not to be, you know, easy on myself and understand that sometimes I make mistakes and, you know, great. You know, everyone, you know, it's okay, you know, I make mistakes all the time, it's fine. You know, we make mistakes, but we don't say it's okay. It is okay in the sense that we're forgiven, but it's not okay in the sense that we tolerate ourselves doing those things. Like, we need to take action. It's like, we do forgive people 70 times, 7 times a day, but we don't allow ourselves the, the runway just to do whatever we feel like doing in the moment, satisfy lust of the flesh, and then say, like, well, grace, I'm forgiven, it's fine, right? I can't do that. It's not the way it works. It's, it doesn't show that good conscience. Like you can't be in good conscience with God if you're doing that. Like you can't be justifying the things that you're doing. And then we look at a truth that Paul gives the first, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, which I love because it's a truth you can hold on to no matter what you're faced with. If you're thinking through using the mind of Christ, you put your mind at your situation and say, okay, he says in verse 12 of chapter 10, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. So you're not special, first of all. And second of all, 
God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And the word for bear there could also be translated suffer. You can suffer through it. So the fact is, is that we can suffer in the things of the flesh. We can suffer um, through sin. We can, we can suffer through the, the ability to avoid these things. You know, like maybe indulging the flesh feels good in the moment. We can suffer ourselves to wade through that and get out of it. We can know that no matter what comes up, we don't have to tolerate giving in because we know that there is always a way of escape, that God would never put something in our path that we can't handle. We may not do it right, but we can always know that there is a way and then maybe the next time we'll do it because we want to do it, because we are compelled to please our, our Savior because we want to do the things that he does and have his same mind because he suffered for us. I'm willing to take some suffering for him, right? At least it's my reasonable service, right? That we, we can't settle and allow ourselves to just move forward in these things. That's what I believe is being said here. Because we have ceased from sin. The word for cease is to res- like completely restrain or we're done with it. You know, you got to tell sin, I'm done with this. Like when it comes up and the temptation is there, like I'm done. And when I say I'm done, I'm done. You know, like, I, I mean it. I'm like, I'm done. Certain things I'm done with recently, and I'm done. Like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. So you get to have that type of anger. Like, Jesus was angry at hypocrisy and sin. And if you're a Christian and you're willing to allow yourself to, to compromise, that is hypocrisy. You'd be done with that. Can't tolerate that. Can't do it. And that's where accountability, that's where speaking amongst ourselves, sharing your life with someone, like confessing to someone, those are so freeing and liberating because once you let that out, Satan has no more power over it anymore. It's, it's out there. And that's, that's the freedom that we have. And that's why the church is so important to come together as the body because we, we're, we're designed to do that. God brought us together to be relational. And so we're ceasing. We're done with these things. We're, we're going to uh, I put in here, we, we, your life comes to a crossroads, you know, because like you got to remember the cross when you're when you make that decision. Like, are you going to go left or right? You know, we're going to we're going to do the right thing or the wrong thing. You can't live for God and just indulge yourself in sin or even live for the world on purpose. You can't allow yourself to do these things. You can't can't do it. And so that's the type of conscience we need to have toward God. That's the kind of mind we have to, to have that's in Christ. And arm ourselves, prepare ourselves for this battle. It's going to be a battle, but God has given you the way to win the battle. And when you lose in a moment, uh, uh, like a battle, not the war, but the battle, you know, you know there is deliverance, there is forgiveness, there is freedom, but you have to take those steps. You can't just think it's, uh, you know, you're going to struggle through it and you're just going to keep on going. Like you've got to do something about it. You have to. Okay, it says here that we should no longer live the rest of this time. I like that. Um, we're, we're not going to spend all any more time in the flesh for the lust of men. We're going to do things for the will of God. We're not going to give any more time to these things. And we talked about this before, and I do it all the time, assessing our time. Um, how many times have you, I even go to make coffee, and I'm like, man, it's already been five minutes. And like, that's five minutes, I'm just waiting for coffee. And like, was I doing anything productive in those last five minutes? No, I was just waiting for coffee. Can't function. You know, that's, but I'm just saying, like, you think about, time goes by, you look down at your phone, you get a notification, and then 15 minutes later, like, wow, I just lost 15 minutes of my life. Doing nothing. You know, wasting it. So essentially, we just need to take charge because we're given this mind, this choice to be able to do things that God wants us to do. The will of God is not to make sure that we keep up on our notifications on our phone. It's not a bad thing, but it's like everything within reason. If, if we just cannot handle not doing those things and we spend so much time doing those things, then we need to reassess our time. We need to reassess what we're living for. Are we living for the lusts of men? And, and you know, you can lust after that like dopamine hit from comments and likes and Facebook posts and like just scrolling through and mindlessly doing things like that. You can lust after those things. It can make you feel real good and just just kind of letting your time go. But we should be living for the will of God is what Peter says here. Don't spend the rest of this time, no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh for the lust of men. We've spent enough time, he says in verse 3. We've done 
enough of our past life in that. We need to move on. Now, speaking about the will of God, I just want to pull up these two references in Thessalon- 1 Thessalonians because they're really, they're really good, and I really like that he just calls it out. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, Finally then, brethren, we urge you and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us, how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know that what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. That you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarned you and testified for God did not call us to uncleanness but to holiness therefore he who rejects this does not reject man but God who has given us his Holy Spirit really that ties things really in quite nicely again again very much in in sync and then he also says later first Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 14 through 18, now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So his will is for us to be sanctified, to be holy, and to pray, rejoice, give thanks. Those are the things that we should be spending our time on. Enough said. Mic drop. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, looking like the world. We came from there. We are dead to that now. We have spent way enough. Like what, what, what Paul says is that like, you know, our, the time is at hand. Like we need to move forward. We cannot just like stay stagnant, backslide, you know, like go up and down. We need to move forward. We need to move up. So we need to be growing and maturing. We spent enough of our past lifetime doing that will. When we walked, he gives us examples. Lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Um, so I mean, that list, you can, you can go through these things, but just essentially we understand that we spent plenty of time in these types of things. And we can all relate to various aspects of this, whether it's sexual immorality, whether it's drunkenness, whether it's you know, just, you know, partying, whether it's, and it even gets all the way down to abominable idolatries or worship of image or serving a God made with hands, right? The things that we, you know, things that we serve and put our time on. Again, I am all for technology and I am all for, you know, information. I use the internet when I study. I use Google Docs because it's so easy to have all our stuff in our hand. But if we give ourselves over to abominable idolatries where our time is completely sucked into our device, our accounts, our logins, our clicks, our likes, our subscribes, our ring the bells, or whatever, you know, like those things, if that's where we define ourselves, that's, that's what makes us who we are, then we're imbalanced. A, a challenge for me is, you know, if, if, can I live without something? Could I like do away with something in my life that I spent a lot of time on? Could I put it aside and not, not touch it or use it like for a season and be okay? Well, the answer is yes. But am I willing to do that? That's a question. And that takes discipline and that takes accountability and that takes um, resolve and that takes you putting your mind on the things that Christ deems worthy and necessary in your life. Putting aside abominable idolatries and you know, like compromise. We don't need those things. They don't edify. They don't give you anything good. So he says, but then he says, guess what? You're going to get sideways looks from everybody else. Like, what's your problem, right? In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation speaking evil of you. I think that's really funny that he uses the term uh, flood of dissipation. Um, Isn't that kind of interesting? We're just talking about the flood. Um, the flood, of, like a flood, duh, and if you, I've never been in a flood before or seen like a flood, I've seen some mudslides, I guess, but think about the power of that water and what it's doing. It just carries things away, like an entire house that you couldn't pick up without like tons of heavy machinery, a flood will come and just take it down, take it out, completely gone. So they think it's weird when you don't run with them in a flood of dissipation. Now, what they'll, and I've even talked to some people recently, 
that find that when they're in their dissipation, whatever it is, when they're practicing the things that they don't want to practice, they know are bad, they, but you know, it brings them momentary joy, they think it's going to work, they're tricked into doing it, and then it just, it just carries them to a place they do not want to go. It takes them down, and they understand that, but they just can't get over it because they're trying to do it in their flesh and not do it in the Spirit. We, we don't have the type of strength to get to overcome these things in, in the flesh. We can't really be delivered from the flood of dissipation. We can't really um, be delivered from these things without the power of God. You, you can have a temporary victory. You can have temporary, and maybe for years, you can have, um, you know, abstain from certain things. But the only real deliverance comes from a changed heart, and that only comes from Jesus Christ. That is the key, and that's why things like Arise or Residential Discipleship, like, it's Christ that delivers them. That's why, like, people that have gone down a flood of dissipation, they've been carried all the way to the bottom, and they're delivered from that and brought back to God. They're, just like he said earlier on, brought back to God. He, he brought them to God, even all the way down there. It's, it's, it's possible. It's completely possible. But they're going to say funny things to you, like, um, why don't you want to have fun? What, what do you have against fun things? Why don't you just loosen up? Like, you were so uptight. What is wrong with you? You know, stuff like that. You're so rigid. You, you, you don't even know what real fun is. You know, that type of thing. But really, dissipation is wastefulness. It's a waste of time. It's just a waste. And uh, I don't want to be one of those, I, I mean, I'm a dad, so I, I have a little bit of that in me, but um, a lot of it. But it is a waste. Like, consider, like, as someone, think, think of it as, a, like, if you're the dad or the, the parents and you're providing for your household and you're putting your money into something and, you're, and then it gets wasted. There's something about that that's like, that's such a, I hate wasting. I don't want to waste it. I just paid for that, right? So you have to kind of think of it in that way. Like, we don't need to waste things. We don't want to go down that path. Even if people question it, they're like, well, I do it. Who cares? Like, well, that's, I don't want to be like that. I, I answer to a higher authority. Like, you can, just like he said before, to be ready with an answer. Like, I, there's a reason that it's not fun. And the people that have had fun with it have been recently telling me, that it's not fun anymore. I'm out of control. I can't even do anything anymore without it. Like, I'm just totally dependent on these things, these substances, these, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And, and God opens it way up. It doesn't matter what it is. If something has control of you, that, that is it. That's the problem. You need to deal with those things. Um, and, and if you are not willing to, then that's, that's the bigger problem you're not willing to deal, if you're not willing to look at what the, the Word says, look at what is being explained, that we need to run from these things. We need to embrace what Christ has in His mind and not things of the Gentiles. And I think sometimes as we get along in our walk and we see, well, we're not doing all those really, really bad things anymore, so I'm pretty much good. I can just kind of hang tight. You know, like, but there's always something that God's working on in your life. There's always something. We're never arrived. Nobody has arrived. We only arrive when we arrive in the presence of the Lord. And even then, we're going to be, you know, in, in a different state, but in this life, we are never perfected in the, in the flesh. We have to deal with those things in the flesh every single day, right? We're delivered, we're forgiven, but we have to arm ourselves for the battle. Otherwise, we're going we're gonna to be downtrodden. All right, verse 5. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel is preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Now, the fact that they will give an account, we read that in Revelation 20. They're going to stand before God. They're going to open the books, just like we, we talked about in verse uh, 12 of Revelation 20. It says, the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written. Anyone who rejects Jesus Christ will give an account for their life. And their life will need to stand, and it'll be opened and judged, and without Jesus, they are they're guilty. Without forgiveness, you're guilty, right? Without, without the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we are all guilty. And so there's no one who is perfect, no one who is able to live up to that. They are going to give an account, especially those 
who run in this flood of dissipation, they're going to give an account. None of it is just, you know, it's only hurting me or it's just for me. You know, it affects all kinds of things. Your choices affect so many different things. You affect way more than you think. And that's why we should have the mind of Christ because he looks at a much bigger picture, right? Zoom out a little bit. Take a look at the impact that you have on people, positive and negative. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead. That's, that's a weird thing to say. How can you preach to people who are dead? Well, as I was reading that, it kind of makes sense. It's not the physical dead, but the spiritually dead, right? That you preach the gospel to those who are dead. And uh, Paul says it too in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 4. It says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. Um, so that sounds, that sounds like they were dead. So it's not dead like corpse. It's dead like spiritually dead. So th- the gospel was preached also to those who are dead that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Now, we can also look at something like this. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6. Um, he, and he, this is what he said. Let me read this, and then we'll kind of finish this up. He says, What shall I say? Is that we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead, indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey in his lust. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Now, they're going to be judged. It says here that we have this truth. The gospel is preached to those who are dead. We understand our position. We're dead in the flesh. The flesh dies. We come, we're resurrected a new life. They might be judged according to men in the flesh. In the flesh, in the world, they're going to judge and be made an example. You're going to be looked at differently. But those who are saved will live according to God in the Spirit. You're going to be those who are actually alive. Spiritually speaking, you're going to be awakened. Just like it says in uh, you got Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And then he goes on in chap, uh, chapter 8, verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. That's what they're comparing to. Those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So we see that contrast there as well. We have the fact that you're going to be judged according to men by the flesh. They're going to look at you different, but we would live according to God in the Spirit through the good news, the gospel. That's where the difference is. When they see the difference in you, they're going to judge you, and you're going to live according to God in the Spirit. And that's, that's what Peter's calling us to. That's what Paul's calling us to. That's what Jesus is calling us to. That's what God is calling us to. To live according to the Spirit. To not settle into the works of the flesh. To not lean back on our old ways. 
to, to look forward and to lean forward. And when you lean forward, you move forward, right? If you, if you don't move, you're going to fall. Like you need to move forward, lean in and move forward in the Spirit. Let the Spirit of God guide you and, and allow you to be delivered from these things and continue to be daily as you, as you go through and live your daily life. So I told you we'd go over and we did. And so that's, that's where we're at. We'll stop there for today and we'll pick up the next time. But for now, let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, we do thank you so much for this time we can be in your word, Lord. Thank you for the fact that we can read these things, that we can look at Scripture, wide stands at Scripture, Old New Testament. We can see your plan from all the way from Genesis to Revelation. And we're so thankful that you had that plan and that you laid it out perfectly and that everything you do is perfect. And I pray, Lord, that we would be those who seek after your will, that we'd want to be in your will and we'd walk in your spirit that you would guide us through, that you'd help us when we get tempted, help us when we start to fall, help us to move forward, Lord, in our lives as we mature and walk toward eternity with you, Lord. We just praise you for the opportunity to be in your kingdom. We praise you for your salvation, and we're so thankful for your resurrection. We praise you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, um,